So tonight, we look to the past to reflect upon the present as we honor the 40th anniversary of the killing of community leader and businessman Arthur Miller Jr. There are so many people to thank and acknowledge in the audience tonight. And chief among them are Arthur Miller's widow, Florence Miller, and daughter, Lolisa Miller Bradford, uh, who join us this evening, traveling from their homes in Florida, and with an open heart gave the Brooklyn Historical Society their blessing to honor the memory of their loved one through this program. They continue the work of healing and empowerment through their organization, the Arthur Miller Jr. A Daughter Never Forgets Foundation. I want to acknowledge former Assemblywoman Annette Robinson, who is here tonight. Yes. And I want to thank our panelists, Lumumba Akiwale Bandale, Thinjiwi Harris, and Al Van, and our moderator, Joanne Reed, for being here tonight. You'll hear more about all of them momentarily. But now I have the privilege of introducing two colleagues and talents who will present the first part of our program, the listening part. Sahir Ali is the oral historian at Brooklyn Historical Society. In this capacity, he records, collects, archives, and curates the lived histories, testimonies, mem memoirs, and narrations of Brooklynites from all walks of life. And Sahir is also co-host of our monthly podcast, Flatbush and Maine, that I just mentioned. Amaka Okechukwa is assistant professor of sociology at George Mason University, where she focuses on racial politics, social movements, and urban studies. In 2016 and 2017, Zahir and Amaka led the oral history project titled Voices of Crown Heights. It's my privilege to invite them to come to the stage to share a series of excerpts from the oral histories that they collected that speak to who Arthur Miller Jr. was, and the impact of his death. Thank you. Good evening and welcome everyone. Um, we're very happy to have you here. And as Marsha uh, stated, uh, I'm the oral historian, but I'm also the co-host of Flatbush and Maine, which is the podcast. We have these postcards out at the visitor's desk Please take one on your way out because today's episode, the episode for this month, is on Arthur Miller. We've done, and Amaka is, uh, is one of our guests on that episode as well. Um, we've done episodes on Malcolm X, on Shirley Chisholm, on W. E. B. Du Bois, on women doctors. It's a, it's, we just cover a lot of stuff that we think you'll be interested in hearing. Um, tonight, of course, we're here to talk about Arthur Miller's life and legacy, and um, Amaka and I encountered and was able to get into this story through the Voices of Crown Heights project, which was a project to examine the history of Crown Heights, a neighborhood that was undergoing and has been undergoing rapid change. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Miller's family is visiting, and I don't know how long it's been since you've been here, but if you had a chance to go back to, was it 925 Prospect Place, you will see how different it is uh, from 40 years ago. And so our oral history project was designed to capture those stories. Um, we're going to play some excerpts, but before we do, I wanted to introduce Amaka, who was the project coordinator for this project and actually conducted all of the interviews that we're going to play from today. So, Amaka. Good evening, everybody. So it's a, a pleasure to be back. I'm at Brooklyn Historical Society. I've been away for about a year. Um, so it's great to be back and I'm honored to be here um, for this event today to remember Arthur Miller and to reflect upon um, organizing um, against police violence in Brooklyn and beyond. Um, you know, when, sorry. So um, in Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, right, Arthur Miller um, is referenced in the dedications. And eerily, in uh, Radio Rahim's Killing, 
also echoes that of Arthur Miller. Um, 40 years ago, when he was killed, um, you know, all the major media outlets in New York covered the fact of his killing, um, as well as mobilization um, against this kind of police violence. Um, and yet, 40 years later, it's not necessarily a story that we hear a lot about, that we come back to. Um, it's not a story that has been documented as much as other um, stories, um, particularly related to police violence. And so when we were reflecting on putting together the Voices of Crown Heights um, oral history collection, um, Zahir and I decided that it was really important for us, a priority for us, um, to capture the story of Arthur Miller so that people today can be reminded of Arthur Miller and those who have come up um, in the interim can be informed about you know, his presence in the community, what he meant to his family members, um, and the um, details surrounding um, the unjustified killing of Arthur Miller. And so I'm really um, glad to be here today and um, I look forward to um, the panel discussion, um, particularly as we think through how to um, change things so that we're not here in another 40 years, right, commemorating another Arthur Miller. So as you listen to these excerpts, we encourage you to, um, we, we call deep listening. Listen to what is said, listen to how it's said, listen to what is not said. Um, we have slides to accompany, and you'll see there is a, a website at the bottom of each slide. All of the oral histories that you are going to be listening to, the full interviews are available online as part of the Voices of Crown Heights oral histories at our oral history portal, which is at brooklynhistory.org slash oral history. So if you want to hear more from these narrators that you're going to hear from, you can log on and there are transcripts and audio. So we invite you now to lend your ears to our narrators. Arthur Miller was a wonderful, to me, uh, businessman who lived over near the Brooklyn Children's Museum in the Brower Park area. And uh, he was the head of a block association over there called the um, Four Star Block Association. When Arthur was uh, killed, um, coming out to try to help his brother, whom the police had uh, ticketed and kind of harassed and followed him around to Arthur's from Nostrand Avenue, where he was, I think, taking up some things uh, around to uh, his brother's place. Arthur came out to, to uh, help uh, his brother and uh, the police uh, jumped him. Uh, he was carrying a gun legally and uh, they, they could see it with his hands up. But he was also known as a community leader. I don't know if any of the police knew him. I do not know because when he died in their custody on the way to the police police department does not like for me to say that he was murdered by the police, but they have no objection to me saying that he died in their custody because they know it's the case. And they threw him out in the yard and there was Stanley Gibbs was a community officer at that time in the police department. Marvelous person. And he said, so of course he knew Arthur, so he said to them, do you know who you have killed? Okay, um, the gentleman that came to the door and was calling me Ms. Arthur, Ms. Arthur, he told me that he was on Nostrand Avenue. I had a blue pickup truck. His brother Joe was driving it. Uh, Joe left the building on Nostrand Avenue and he was going to, towards Rogers Avenue. Where he was going, I don't know. The police stopped Joe. Now see this, I, I don't understand. The police stopped Joe with, in the truck because he had a suspended license. How do they know his license had been suspended? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? Okay. Then they sent him back to get the owner of the truck, which was odd. Why? Mm -hmm. 
Why did they send him to, to, to get his brother? Mm -hmm. You know, if they wanted, why didn't they take him in the truck back to Notion Avenue? They had ought to come to towards Rogers Avenue. Now, um, I had a permit for a gun that he used to wear on his side. Mm -hmm. He got the permit uh, through the police department. He took shooting lessons on target things through the police department. The police was always in our building, uh, lifting weights with him, doing everything. So they all knew he had the gun. All of a sudden, the guy said he held up his hand, they saw his gun, and the police panicked. Why would they panic? It was holstered. They knew he had it. Mm -hmm. And he said, all hell broke loose. He said, I don't know what was it. He said, they were, they just, there were so many of them on him. We don't know what happened. And then they drug him in the car. Mm -hmm. Then I heard that uh, Art was coming around the building. They didn't, I didn't hear that Joe had gone. They said that Arthur was walking down, uh, what was that, Park Place? I think it was Park Place. He was walking down Park Place, and uh, he was jumped by the police. I don't know. I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But then his brother told us that he was told to go and get his brother. He don't know how the police knew his license had been suspended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they said, well, it was an accident because the police panicked when they saw the gun. They had no way of knowing that uh, it was registered. They had no way of knowing this. They had no way of knowing that. And it was pushed under the rug as usual when they told a black man. This was a guy who had never should have been attacked by the police. Witnesses say he was handcuffed, more than one, pushed into the police car, choked after they drove him away. The, the, um, the, there was no room, no wiggle room for it. He brought it on himself. So the community was feeling justifiable or justified in their anger. These demonstrations were calling on the people to be in the street. And, and that's what was uh, powerful about it. It was the beginning of a movement where the people themselves felt confident, comfortable in expressing their displeasure, their anger, their frustration. So, so now people are saying that the, uh, the police are the criminals. And people in the, in the community have, have felt that all the time. Arthur wanted to get involved in everything. You know, he was excited about the city and excited about doing things. And he kept saying something he remembered when he was a little boy in Nassau about leaving a legacy, not wanting his footsteps to be washed away. He wanted, when he left this earth, he wanted something left behind to say, I was here. So thank you very much for, for listening, and I hope that you have been given some things to reflect upon um, as we welcome our panelists onto the stage. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator who will introduce the rest of the panelists. Um, Joanne Reed, many of you are familiar with her. She is the, <laughs> she is the host of AM Joy, which airs on MSNBC Saturdays and Sundays from 10 a.m. to noon. She is, has become a wonderful friend of this institution. She's appeared here before at a previous event on Crown Heights. She is a Brooklynite. She is a Crown Heights resident. So she cares very deeply about this history and the stories of, of this neighborhood. And uh, with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Joy Reid to the stage. Black Lives Matter case that goes 40 years before we were even 
even coining the phrase. Let me introduce this wonderful panel, and I'll introduce them um, going from uh, right to left. And we're going to start um, with Tenjiwe McHarris. Um, and she spent her entire political and professional career challenging the injustices that imprison people and their communities in a life of poverty um, and or behind bars. That commitment has led her to campaign on human rights issues in the United States and around the world. She honed her human rights campaign development and organizing skills while working for international organizations and has played key roles in helping to lead high profile mobilizations around the country. Tenjiwe currently works with a team called Black Blackbird, which is focused on movement building in this current historical moment, and Blackbird provides communication, organizing, and policy advocacy support to a growing field committed to ending racism in the United States. No small task. She is also currently working with a number of social justice organizations and movements in the U.S. and helping to establish a collective for organizers engaged in movement building work around the world. Please give Tenji Wei McCarris a round of applause. And then to uh, Tenji Wei's left is Lumumba Akinwole Bandele, and he's the senior community organizer at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. He's a longtime community organizer and educator from central Brooklyn. From 1994 to 1998, Lumumba served as programming coordinator at the Franklin H. William Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute, called CCC. During his tenure at CCC, he also co-founded Aza Bache, which is an organizer's training conference and workshop series for young activists, all the while as a black studies major at City College at, of New York, CUNY. He also went on to receive his master's in human service from Lincoln University in 1998 as a member and organizer with the Malcolm X grassroots movement. Mr. Akinwole, uh, Akinwole Bandele helped to establish its campaign to counter police abuse and misconduct. He also co-founded the world-renowned Black August Hip Hop Project. Black August raises awareness and support for political prisoners in the United States, and from 2002 to 2000. 2007, Lumumba served as counselor and lecturer at Megar Evers College, CUNY, uh, and he currently serves on the board at the Center for Constitutional Rights and is band chair at the Caribbean Cultural Center Afri African Diaspora Institute. Please give him a round of applause. And on the end, y'all probably already know this gentleman, Al, uh, Albert Al Van was born and raised in Brooklyn's Bed-Stuy, Bedford-Stuyverson neighborhood. Bed-Stuy always showing out. <laughs> See, when they say Crown Heights, words are so quiet. <laughs> the best time people go, boop, that's that, and I'll jump out. Uh, he's a former New York City Council member and served his home community in the New York State Legislature from 1974 to 2001. He also served in the United States Marine Corps and had a distinguished career in the field of education as an administrator, teacher, and advocate as, at many schools in Brooklyn. Councilman Van is also the founder of the African American Teachers Association and served as chairman of the New York State Black and Puerto Rican Caucus, which he led in 1981 in a Supreme Court fight that prevented the racial gerrymandering of the New York City Council. Please give uh, Mr. Van and so, I want to also let uh, all of you know we did also uh, obviously acknowledge that Mr. Miller's family is here, um, and so it's it's very important that they are in the place as well. Uh, but we also want you all to feel that you can participate in this conversation. There are cards that are going to be going around, and the lovely people from the Brooklyn Historical Society will be distributing them. So if you have questions, we're going to incorporate those after we have some discussion, so that you guys can be a part of it as well. Um, so let's just jump right into it, and I'm going to I'm going to go to you first, um, Commissioner Van. Um, you know a lot. A lot of people, I think, nowadays are not as familiar with what happened to Arthur Miller, and when they hear it, um, it sounds very much like the Eric Garner story. It sounds very similar in the sense that, you know, we learned through the Garner story that police are still using the chokeholds, that it's still happening, but a lot of people thought it was illegal, and that was sort of the, you know, revelation that supposedly came out of the Garner case. Can you tell us what happened in the wake of what happened to Mr. Miller? Did anything change? Did anything happen? Was there any consequence to anyone who was involved in his death? Uh, not to my knowledge, and I think we owe uh, the Miller family an apology mm -hmm. in effect because we have not yet created the environment and made the changes necessary where that any person who lives in America will get the same level of justice and that uh, all lives matter and that a black person, a black boy, a black man cannot be killed by police and justice not be served. 
So we have not yet been able to create and make those changes. So Arthur will know that uh, his life was not in vain. Uh, but what we should recognize is because of who he was, a uh, community leader, a family man, a very prominent person within the community, there was indeed outrage. And the community rose to the occasion, as it were, because Arthur was not the first black man to have been killed by a chokehold by police. Mm -hmm. But he's one of the first where we raised the consciousness of the city because of the outrage and the people that came to protest and to, de and to demand justice. That's why I say an apology is in order because until we have been able to deal with that equation, with that phenomenon, then you know I feel we have not really served Arthur and done well by him, but we shall. If not in my lifetime and yours, but we will stay in motion and we will stay engaged until we're able to bring about the changes in the system, which we'll probably speak to, I guess, uh, before the evening is thrown. Yeah. And, and you know, Tenji, I felt like there's so many elements of this case that echo to today. Um, Mr. Miller being a licensed gun owner, uh, I, you know, maybe we can dig in the historical record and see if the NRA gave him any support. Uh, <laughs> maybe we won't find much of that, but that is reminiscent of the things we're seeing today. So many of the injustices that happened to this man um, are reflective of what we're dealing with today. Um, for you as an organizer, I wonder how frustrating it is to feel that you know you go back 40 years and the same characters that we're still that we're seeing, um, you know, impacted by police brutality in the exact same way. Mm. A lot of those are wrapped up in this one case. Mm. Um, right. I mean, I'm I'm overwhelmed and um just feeling a lot i just want to first say it's it's really humbling to be here to not just uh, recognize a deep injustice but to also honor a person and a human and a life and i'm very humbled to be in the presence of the family and the way you have organized and led and built movement is is a testament to this idea that we will actually see a nation where this doesn't happen anymore. So I just want to say, like, I'm humbled to be in your presence. And, you know, yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to hear another name and to know it's part of so many names throughout history of our people who have been so devalued that they have been taken from those that they loved. Um, and that there's so many families connected still fighting for justice and not getting justice. And so it's painful. It's painful. Um, and I think about Eric Garner's family. I think about Romarley Graham's family. I think about all these families. But what helps me um, lean into this, this reality that I know we're gonna win is because I see families like y'all who say that we will never forget our, our, our family member, our loved one. And so I just wanted to, to yeah. say that. And, and Lamont, I guess the sort of obvious question that we ask every time these cases come up over and over and over again. We were talking in the back about the Romarley Graham case, which is also similar in the outcome and for the police. Why don't police go to jail when they kill someone who is unarmed, doing nothing wrong, not committing a crime? Why don't they ever go to jail? We haven't created the environment to make sure that they are punished, whether they go to jail or not. That's a quite frankly honest answer. Politically, they are not held accountable economically, they are not held accountable. In any other kind of way, they are not held accountable. And I think when we begin to examine it that way, I think we begin to question what is our uh, responsibility, both individually and collectively, in this, in this space. What can we do to make sure that this, this pattern does not continue? Because when you talk about what justice is, justice isn't not simply having someone go to jail. Justice means that we have prevented this from happening again. Mm -hmm. What are we doing to enact justice? Mm -hmm. Individually and collectively. If you sit in elected office, what are you doing to make sure that this does not happen again? If you are part of a union, what are you doing to make sure? I think we all have mm -hmm. responsibility. And I think once we begin to really look at that, um, we'll be able to answer that question quite frankly and not be really distracted because I have to say this, you know, when we have these discussions, oftentimes inevitably we get to this, well, what do we want to do to increase police community relationships? I want to be very clear. That's never been the objective. Mm -hmm. The objective is stopping the murders of our family members, of our community members, having the power to prevent it. 
When we have that power, that relationship will happen. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about developing relationships as the objective, it's insulting, number one, because it's, it's, it's almost as if like we don't know better, right? That's never been the objective. If we have the ability to prevent it, then yeah, we can start talking about what a relationship equitably will look like. Yeah, and, and I mean, for, to, to that point, Commissioner Van, you know, the legislative fixes seem never to happen. There seems to be just a complete stasis when cases like this happen. You know, you look at the laws, you look at the Supreme Court rulings that are for the police all the way up, you know, to the Supreme Court. It seems that there isn't a legislative fix. At the time um, when Arthur Miller was killed, was there any discussion about changing the laws in a way that were not so 100% favorable toward the police? Uh, no, they weren't. I mean, I was in the assembly at that time, barely. I had just gotten there. And there was no discussion at that legislative level of addressing that particular issue. And I wish to, uh, uh, Brother Mandali is correct. Uh, and I like to, sometimes you have to go back to go ahead. And I think it's important that we acknowledge the origin of why uh, black life does not matter. And we have to go back to the beginning. You have to go back to the kidnapping, the raping, and the murdering of African people who were brought in on the slave ships, treated inhumanely, sanctioned by the church, by the way, and then uh, treated as inhuman, less than human, sold as property in these United States and are responsible for capitalizing this America. America is the richest, most powerful country because of the slave labor and skills that uh, African people brought. And even after uh, slavery was abolished legally, you know, you had the uh, Jim Crow, you had uh, the chain gangs, you have now prison industrial complex and so forth, and all of that has led to a system where the institutions in America are racist. And so the police department is an institution in America, and so it manifests that inherent racism. That's why you have that blue line, and that's why you have that culture which you're trying to find a way of how we deal with that. I wanted to say that so that we would understand it's not though you just go and you pass a law or you change an executive order, or you do something like that and all of that's mm -hmm. gonna change. Mm -hmm. It is entrenched, it is deep. And so we have to understand it and deal with it. And it can be dealt with, both from the top and from the bottom. I don't wanna manipulate the time right now uh, and you know, unless I mm -hmm. license to go ahead. No, keep going. All right, okay. That's like in church, keep it going. <laughs> Uh, it, it, is my, it is my belief, and I think we all agree, common sense, that I always say uh, the anecdote to racism is political empowerment. Uh, it's not about changing hearts uh, or changing minds. It's about what I found out when I was an assemblyman, that when people came into my office up in Albany and they needed something, they respected the fact that I was there, and, and they may not have liked the fact that I was black and I was there, but because I had the power to make things happen, then they showed me the respect that they should have shown me anyway. So I said, uh-huh, the way to get things done is to have the power, all right? And that's, and that's the anecdote. And I say that to say that if we have a mayor who, who shares our belief about justice for all, and he picks a police commissioner, all right? Then they set the tone and the model of how that police department will work. A police department is a paramilitary organization. They take orders from the top. What you think, what you believe, doesn't matter. Follow orders. Respect the people that you are sworn to protect. So, so that tells you if you don't have the power to become the mayor, then you have to have the power that the mayor will respect. And that way you begin to affect the policy. And that's true at every level of government. I believe in the mass movement. I believe in the protests. I've been a part of it during my, during my life. And I understand that it's, it's critical. At some point in time, when they take a life of a black boy or a black man, the community must rise. They must demonstrate their hurt and their pain and demand that justice be served. 
and we get a reaction at the moment. And a little something happens. Sometimes some changes are made. Not enough to really solve, you know, solve that problem, but they, they reduce the tension because they do a little something. So obviously that's not enough. So what else has to happen other than that protest which we must do? It must be translated into power. And I see it happening now. I see young people getting involved and, they, and they're showing their outrage and, and so forth, but they also said, but now we're gonna register and vote. That's new. That's a, that's a new dimension yep. uh, that is necessary. One, one other thing, then I'll uh, yield. It, it must happen from the top and it must also happen from the bottom. In the local community, we have a responsibility. There's a system created where you are engaged with your precinct. They call it precinct council. Well, I call it precinct council. It's the New York City Police Community Council, I think official. I think they first organized and started them in 1943 or something. That's when they set up. So you'd have this dialogue with the community. That's a bridge, that's a vehicle. We need to take that vehicle. We need to have diversity of our community, young people, everybody involved in that, because we can affect and impact that precinct commander. We can establish our priority. We can help develop what the underlying philosophy is of that precinct as they police and protect our people. We can help them to understand that it's not just about law and order, it's about preemption, it's about making sure that crime does not, are not uh, committed in our particular community. So though, I just wanted to lay that mm -hmm. on the table. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and I'll, you know, I'm going to come to you on this, Tendra, because a lot of the times when we're now talking about um, the violence against black people in spaces where they're deemed not wanted, um, it's partly a gentrification con conversation, right? If you come to Crown Heights now, it's different than it was Crown Heights then. You go to Bed-Stuy, Bedford Stuyvesant, suddenly it's different. Fort Greene is unrecognizable. It's just completely different. I used to live in Fort Greene. I used to pay 450 a month for an apartment in Fort Greene. It, Fort Greene was a different place. Um, but in the case of, of Arthur Miller, he was the one who was the business owner. Mm -hmm. He was the one who was sort of the, the, the person that had, you know, means he was a community leader. This is somebody who was living in the community as a leader in the community. And it was the police mm -hmm. who had the reputation for thuggery. Mm -hmm. The 77th precinct was notorious. There was allegations that they were trying to bribe and rob him, that they were trying to extort people. So you had to, it was, it's upside down to what we normally talk about when, he, when you talk about these cases. So I wonder if in your view as an activist, why in your view that wasn't more dispositive in the, rea in, in the outcome? Mm. that the police were the ones who were notorious in this case, not the dead man. Mm. Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, I feel, the one thing I'll say, um, I, you know, I grew up in the Bronx. And I, like growing up, there was always a relationship that we had to the police. And it wasn't one that, where we ever felt safe. And it wasn't one where we ever felt like we could trust the police in our neighborhood. So there's, there's, there's a long history, no matter where you are, of um, not being able to trust the activity of the police, especially in relationship to your own life. And I think that is directly connected to the ways in which, and also like the history and legacy of policing, criminal, criminalizing black life, criminalizing our communities, and really um, in spaces where it's, uh, in spaces where, where just our existence and our presence is criminalized. Um, so it's not just our communities, it's our bodies that are criminalized. Um, and so I feel like no matter where we are, whether you're in a suburb somewhere or in a neighborhood in the Bronx, oftentimes just our existence is made vulnerable because we are deemed criminal. And, and not just adult men, but also, or, or adult women, but also our children. Our children are made criminal. And so, so that's always, you know, has, has, has always hap happened. And, and just to go to the point that was made earlier in terms of, like, and so then what do we do? Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like the work of movements is um, to make visible what's been often rendered invisible, to expose contradictions. And that's what mass mobilizations do. That's what going to the streets and protesting does. It's saying to the world, they keep taking our people from us. And it's, it's because they, they do not value black life and they target, target black life. 
And additionally, the role of movements is also to say, once that has been exposed, once that contradiction has been made visible, then how do we get at the root and the cause that continues to make this happen in our communities, continues to, to target and criminalize and incarcerate and take our people from us? And so, I feel like to that point, it's sort of how are ways in which as movements we're thinking about um, dealing with the, the issue of policing, which is sort of the criminalization of, of our communities, the criminalization of our bodies, and the policing of our people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then I guess when, when people are, you know, in the case of, of Mr. Miller, he's going to the aid of his brother, um, you know, he, he's complying with the law, he isn't committing a crime. What are our rights in those situations? If you see an injustice happening, you're the older brother in this case, you're Arthur Miller, and you see your brother is being hassled by the police, what, what do you have the right to do? It's interesting because um, <clears throat> after the uh, killing of Amadou Diallo in 99, um, uh, the Malcolm X grassroots movement, who I was very active with at, at the time, decided that we were going to, instead of responding uh, regularly, as we have done in the past with protests and rally, we were going to do something a little more different and try to be more proactive with it. And we developed what we call the People Self Defense Campaign. And it was a three prong approach to dealing with policing. The first was a Know Your Rights series uh, trainings. Mm -hmm. And we did that because what existed before. When people did a training on what your rights were, you can ask any young person, primarily young people who went through these trainings, they felt leaving dehumanized. Right. Because they are told legally what the police can and cannot do, mm -hmm. legally what you can and cannot do, but then they're also told the reality. Right. That mm -hmm. you just need to get yourself home. Right. Right, and so we developed a three R approach to dealing with that. We called it rights, reality, and then responsibility. And that third responsibility meaning organizing that we literally do not have an option. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have the luxury to contemplate whether or not we are satisfied with that reality. That third R is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. And so to answer your question, what are, you, what, what, what are the rights? He was legally armed. Mm -hmm. right. He did everything according to the law. But that did not matter at all. And so when we talk about how do we prevent this, we really are seriously have to you know, engage this conversation. What are we doing to prevent this? Mm -hmm. What seriously are we doing to prevent this? And one of the things that, that's important to know is, is that during this time, there was, you know, I, I teach community organizing. So mm -hmm. you know, I always say that it's important for us to always, always be engaged in some level of community organizing. Mm -hmm. And at the, at the time that this was happening, the Black United Front was just being formed. Al Van's Vanguard was on the scene. The East was on the scene. Brooklyn Core was on the scene. And we can't have this conversation without really talking about the work of Reverend Herbert Daughtry in the House of the Lord Church. Mm -hmm. We really can't have this conversation without that. And so those four entities came together and formed the Black United Front. Mm -hmm. And Buff decided they were going to respond to the killing of Arthur Miller with a community patrol. And they stood outside in uniform with a jacket, I don't know if you all remember this, I was four years old, but I remember this. Green jacket with Arthur Miller's face on the back of it, a wall of black men standing in front of the 77 precinct saying no more. So it wasn't simply the protest, but it was also what was happening in terms of the strategy of elected officials. Shortly after that, Roger Green, who was state assemblyman over the 57th, um, introduced some legislation for a special prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Independent prosecutor was called at that time. So, People were a part of a larger strategy that wasn't excluded to just simply yelling in the street. Mm -hmm. And it was really part of a proactive, protracted kind of strategy that still exists today. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, uh, let's go to Alvan on this. Then what materially changed when it came to the 77th Precinct and the way they operate as a result of that activism? My recollection is that up until recent years, the 77th precinct has been notorious forever. Right. I'm probably the oldest person in this room, and I can't remember when the 77th didn't have a reputation of brutality. Uh, that's probably have changed in these recent years, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I've never lived, I've lived in a black community all my life, so I haven't lived in a white community. But I don't ever recall hearing of a young white boy or a young man being shot 
unarmed being shot by a cop. Uh, it, I, I guess I missed part of my education. I needed to visit you know, some of my communities that are white and see what is their relationship with the police. Do they have to, are they as fearful as our kids are and going out in the street? Do they fear that they may, harm may come from those who are supposed to protect them? And if, if, if my notion is correct, and I'm going back to what I said in the beginning, and once we understand the magnitude of that problem that we are dealing with, and that it doesn't just affect black people, that dehumanize people if we accept that behavior from those in power, all right? And see, the blessing in what I see, and, and if you observe, have observed the massive demonstration that is occurring these days, it's a very diverse group of people. It's not just black people. It's not just Latino people. It's people who want to see a change. And to me, that's the promise. That's, that gives me hope, you know? And one time, it was just us out there. You know, we're the one, we're the victims, and we're responding. But now, when you see what's happening, people are concerned about what's happening. We better be concerned about what's happening in this country because, well, I'm getting into your thing. <laughs> <laughs> because I see the fundamental institutions being challenged mm -hmm. right now. I think it's, it's, it's on the scale. I don't know if everybody sees this the same way. To me, mm -hmm. it's like it's going to be now or never. We're going to. Anyway, I, I, believe, I believe that the nature of the problem is such that all people who believe in this country and who believe in justice will be supportive of all of the movements, whether it's legislature or from, or from the community, that is moving towards eliminating that value that the police department represent and not addressing all communities and all people the same. We have to address that, and I believe everybody has a stake in that, because it's not just, if it's those over here now, it'll be you over here next. So it's important that we all come together and deal with the lack of justice because of the nature of this America and how we have evolved to this point, not providing after the needs of the other brothers and the other sisters. Yeah. And so I wonder then from the point of view of also activists and also from a legal point of view, what would actually change um, the, the ability of police to get away literally with killing someone unarmed? What, what changes should activists specifically be calling for? Do you want to go first? I like you <laughs> yeah, go I mean, first. what should change in the law? So there, there, there are a number of things that, you know, that happen. We, we know that, number one, there is no silver bullet, right? There isn't one thing that will end this. We know it has to come from different ways. Um, right now, people are calling for there to be uh, some direct impact on police officers' individual um, ability to access their retirement funds. Okay. Um, so being able to sue an be, individual officer. Being able to sue them, but also that if they actually are caught being uh, doing anything that is under you know misconduct or even for, for the sake of uh, this conversation taking someone's life that they are no longer able to access their retirement fund and we know that the majority of police officers go to that work so that they can get that nice package yeah. you know at the end of their retirement so we think things like that help we know that um, a few years ago the governor signed an executive order now uh, putting in place a special prosecutor here in New York State that looks at these cases we know that local district attorneys have not shown a history of being able to and actually actually uh, investigating and indicting mm -hmm. these cases. Um, we know that what's happening right now, there's a number of initiatives across the country where black folks, brown folks, uh, are looking at ways that we actually begin to solve a lot of these issues and problems ourselves without calling the police. Right. Right. We know that people who do violence interrupter work are now being dispatched as opposed to calling the police. People who do um, domestic violence work are being dispatched as opposed to calling the police. And we know for certain now mm -hmm. there's an increase in the demand for people who do mental health work mm -hmm. to be able to be dispatched as opposed to calling the police. Mm -hmm. So all of these things really have to be taken under consideration when we really are trying to examine how we minimize, if not at the end of the day, totally stop 
police yeah. murders of our, our community. And I wonder when it, when it comes to activism, I mean, we are at the point now where, you know, NFL players who are trying to stand up against this kind of brutality against uh, black men and women, you know, black bodies are being attacked by none, none less than the president of the United States and being having their livelihoods threatened if they kneel for the anthem. So it does feel like the pressure on activists is just getting greater, mm -hmm. um, but the actual changes on the ground, you know, people are still dying. So I wonder, can you talk a little bit about the pressure on activists, you know, from 1978 to now? It seems like it's got, the pressure's gotten worse. Ooh, has it gotten worse? I don't, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's gotten worse. Um, I'm not sure if it's gotten worse. Um, but you know, we have, you know, under the administration that we have now and the shift in our government, we have, um, and also simultaneously, there's more people being, the, the visibility of protesting police violence is different now because we have social media, because we have different ways in which people are sharing yeah. their anger, their frustration, but also when something happens in our community, we're able to share it quickly in ways we couldn't do decades ago. And so really that there's an increase in awareness. And the increase in awareness means two things, that more people are talking about it in the public sphere, but that also means that those in positions of power want to tighten the grip. So the tightening of the grip is happening with the, 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 the Collins. The tightening of the grip is happening when um, the most visible sort of um, movement leaders are talking about it. Like the, there, there's a desire to silence. So in that way, there is an increase in in pressure because of the ways in which we we've been able to increase increase visibility. And so then it's like, what do we do about that? Well, I think Lumumba spoke to various different tactics where we can put pressure on um, you know local law enforcement, where we can put pressure on government. But there's multiple different ways in which we can um, we could try to minimize the harm within our communities. One, it is targeting elected officials and letting them know that if you continue to let our people die without trying to get any kind of accountability, we will not let you come back into office again. It's also pressuring police unions. Police unions are protecting these police officers like no other. Um, so there's various different ways in which we have to target um, who is in positions of power who are protecting individuals and institutions that take our, the life of our people and then don't let us get justice. But the truth is, is that in addition to fighting for accountability for individuals, we must we must interrogate the entire institution that really creates, breeds, and produces police officers that are armed, ready, and and not just willing, but encouraged to take the life of our people. This is an institutional problem and a structural problem that we must interrogate. And the way we need to begin this process is to question to ourselves, mm -hmm. what is the role of policing in America? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I wanna come back to that elected official piece, because I think a lot of people kind of don't think about the district attorney as an elected official. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment, but I do wanna ask, you brought up social media, and I guess I have to ask, and this is a very tough question, particularly facing the, 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 the family as I ask it. You know, it's painful to ask, but I feel like I have to ask this question because social media was brought up. Had what happened to Arthur Miller happened, unfolded on camera, if there had been video of it, would anything different have happened to those officers? We know that's not the case. Right. Yeah. We know that's not the case. We know that, I mean, and I think this is the reality. I think this is why we have the rage that you see. You know, because you're going to tell me now that I didn't see what I just saw? Right. Yeah. Right. You're going to tell me that I didn't see this man just choke the life out of this man right here? Like on camera? Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, no, it was not that? So no, it, it, I, I think technology will help inform the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. It will help that, 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 that discussion. Will that translate to justice in the courtroom? It has not been proven to do so. Yeah. Mm. And we know that it, you know, 13 years late after this, um, we saw the Crown Heights riots happen you know, because you had this continuing injustice in the same part of, uh, of New York City. I wonder if there was any change among elected officials. We know that these district's attorneys often are Democrats. They're often in the same mm -hmm. political party as the African-American community, uh, that they are disserving in a lot of ways. And I wonder if just as a former elected official, if you find challenges in getting the community to really sort of make that connection. You talked about voting being important, but not just the mayor, but the DA. Yeah, well, you know, I, I believe in going to basic causes and. And see, a lot of the experiences that we have is because as a country we fail to inform 
uh, the people about the system that they live under and what rights they have. Most people do not understand the system that they live under. For instance, more than half the people in this country aren't registered to vote. And of those that are registered around that same half don't come out and vote. Yeah. Which is why an illegitimate president <laughs> could become president, all right? Um, and I mean, this, this, is, this is very serious. And so you carry that, uh, how do you get a system to work in a participatory democracy when people are not participating? And so the challenge, and it's a difficult challenge, is to get the victims, those who are being victimized, to have to believe, believe in that system to participate to change it when the system is victimize, victimizing them. We know that's the only way it's going to happen. And that challenge is ours, I, that we have not found a way, and, and it should not be left to po politicians, elected officials, mm -hmm. because there's such a, uh, a demand to want to get reelected, to be back in office. And so you can't follow a, you know, a long-term project necessarily. You got to stop and say, what I got to do to get elected? But we have not yet found that the motivation that will force our people to understand if you got a problem with police, you got a problem with education, you got a problem in health care, there's nothing that can happen right away to change that, but there is hope it can be changed if you get the right people in the right place to make those decisions. Yeah. Because they're spending your money and they're de determining that policy. It's fi everything is fixable. Everything is fixable. Mm -hmm. And all we have to do, and all we have to do is how do we translate that message? How do we get you down and out, you got problems trying to make it from day to day? How, I'm gonna, how am I gonna get you to say, hey, I'm gonna go out and vote? Yeah. It well, seems so remote, yeah. you know, voting for something and dealing with your everyday needs and your everyday problems. Well, I wonder just as a, a counterpoint to that, if okay. you know, this uh, killing took place around the same time uh, that the person who's currently in the President of the United States was mm -hmm. embroiled in uh, litigation with the federal government over housing discrimination, when black people were having a hard time getting an apartment in Queens, right, because there was active housing discrimination going on. And I wonder if from the point of view of the community, if you're a black person living in Crown Heights, well, my God, if they would kill a community leader a well-known person like yeah. Arthur Miller. This wasn't an unknown person. This was a community leader. And I think, I wonder mm. if you get the sense that mm. there is a certain demoralization right. that if, a, if somebody in a leadership position like Mr. Miller could be killed and nothing happened, right. I wonder how then you, how do you convince people that it right. is worth right. trying, you know what I mean? That, that, that something as simple as voting can change right. things if this man is right. being... Yeah treated this you, way. You preaching now. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think our, if our, our people don't just not vote, I mean, they're locked out of a, a quote unquote democratic project in a number of different ways. A lot of our folks can't even access the right to vote or oftentimes are discouraged from voting. And then those that do engage in the, part, are in, in, the in the democratic project have often been betrayed by those that they voted for. And so we have to, we, and, and so then, you know, when we do then talking about engaging and participating in civic engagement, it's, it's really up to movements to have a strategy around, we need to be in a position now more than ever to influence, help set and move agendas that mitigate harm for our people and that allows us to experiment with alternative ways of protecting each other. And so can we develop a strategy that we put, we, we, we encourage certain, we encourage our people to engage and to vote in a way in which that is, that is um, connected deeply to a strategy where they understand, they're not just voting for a person. We continue to have people in, in public office betray us, but they're voting for a set of ideas. They're voting in alignment with the movement that is trying to run a strategy because we know we are not gonna get freedom and we're not gonna get safety through the political through this particular political project but we can build it out of a strategy that we create and we must think about how is electoral politics and electoral um, the electoral strategy what role does that play in the bigger picture mm -hmm. and I wonder what um, five, okay we're, we're almost to your question so make sure that you know those cards are coming around because in a few minutes we're gonna get your questions in but I want to ask you know one more question and it is sort of a technical question for you um, Lumumba because my our, our, the assumption that many of us have is that chokeholds are illegal 
and that they've been illegal in part because of the Arthur Miller case. So I wonder if you could just answer that question from a legal point of view. Are chokeholds legal or not? So chokeholds are not illegal. And I think that's part of the confusion. They are against police procedure. Right. You know, as is a number of other things, stealing the stapler from the office. Right. Against police procedure and policy. But it's not illegal. So again, when we talk about what are some of the things that people can do, if we can create some legislation that actually, actually makes that illegal, then, then we're talking. Then we have something else to stand on in terms of being able to file charges against it. Because it's important to recognize, you know, after Arthur Miller, you know, uh, well, even before that, people really didn't think any, any, anything beyond um, Eric Garner. Some people were able to think about Anthony Baez in 94. Some people even go back to Michael Stewart. Yeah. And what year was that? In 83, mm -hmm. right? Evans. Randy, well, you know, Randy Evans was shot. But in terms of people with the actual chokehold, there's a long list of people. There's a long list of people. And what has happened, however, though, I think after Arthur Miller, the conversation has been able to influence in a small bit what police policies actually look like how and when they engage in a chokehold, when they are not supposed to, and then eventually a total ban of it. And yeah. so even with the ban, again, there's a distinction between it being illegal mm -hmm. and you're not supposed to do it because of a, a policy. So that's a specific piece of legislation that the public could seek is to make yes. the chokehold illegal, which is stunning to me that it is not illegal. Exactly. All right, so let's, uh, let's get these cards coming up. I believe that they are they're, they're on their way up to the stage. Oh, I see them. Um, and we're going to direct these. Some of them probably are, are specifically directed, but some may be to the entire panel. Um, here they are. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So we're going to start uh, with this one. Considering that, thank you. Considering that 40 years ago, um, there was none in terms of the number of organizations in power of black organizations than now. I'm sorry, I'm not reading this really well. Are we, a better, are we in a better position to uh, affect change um, for black justice now? And they're saying, please compare the social movements um, of the structural hope we have now that we didn't have then. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm having trouble reading your writing. But I think what they're saying is, if you could just consider that we don't have, we didn't at the time have, you know, we have, Black Lives Matter isn't exactly formal, but it's a, yeah. it has a structure, then we didn't have that thing. Can you compare? Yeah, I think the, uh, the internet and the social media, explosion of social media has been a tremendous, tremendous support to trying to bring about justice uh, for police uh, brutality and abuse. Look at the ability we have to organize mass resistance because of the social media aspect. So that's very, very significant. I mean, we're not gonna get to the point where we're controlling politically all the spots we need to have right away. Mm -hmm. But the pressure that comes from when the people rise up and show mass resistance, you can immediately respond. That's important. The only, the problem well, not the problem, but the challenge that we have now, as I've said before, is how do you translate that rage and that resistance, that consciousness, into an ability to affect the power? And it's happening now. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's, it, it's a new element that we didn't have back in the day, all right? So I think uh, from Arthur to now, that's another weapon we have in, the, in that arsenal. And the other thing I wanted to say earlier because it's not just about voting, because you just can't get a person to vote. You have to get a person involved. People who involve see the need to vote. But sure. you know, in, in, in being around and, and meeting with the brothers from the continent from time to time, they impressed upon me three things that we need to do in this country as black people to resolve a lot of our problems. The first one was to organize. The second one was to organize, <laughs> and the third one was to organize. And there is no substitution for that. Yeah. We must be organized around a lot of issues. Yeah, and I have to say, because I think at some point we need to really do an examination of the work of uh, Alvan, the work of Vanguard, the work that came out of that particular time period, because uh, Annette Robinson is in the audience, Annette, Alvan, Roger Green, they didn't just walk into those elected seats. Like there was a very strong, clear movement that 
put them in those seats. And that was a part of this particular movement that we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's some models that we have, right? We know that if we were talking about the educational issues, and this is a man who co-founded African Teachers Association, we can talk about the impact of the Ocean Hill Brownsville uh, school takeover had on our understanding of what our limitations were in terms of the public school system. We were talking about the issues around housing. We're talking around issues around employment, all of those things. There was an organized effort to be able to articulate what the issues were and how we wanted to address those things. And we got some people that's gonna actually do that in the assembly. We got some people that's gonna do that in the city council. That's part of what Tenjiwe was, Tenji was talking about. Mm -hmm. It's a strategy. It's not just electing those individuals. They're nice people. <laughs> but they were representing a movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, this is a, this is a good one. Um, it's, there seems to be a lot of pressure to keep professionals quiet. Um, many are attacked, um, I guess, when they associate with these mass movements. Um, so I guess the question being, how can you, I mean, I, I had a, a, a friend of mine who's an attorney text me this morning saying, you know, they were with, at a meeting with a lot of other attorneys and they've all been quietly talking among themselves about how they're nervous to speak out mm. um, about even things like the child separation, et cetera, because you don't know what the consequences are to your mm. career. Mm -hmm. People are afraid. Mm. So how do you get people to get past being afraid, particularly professionals who are being encouraged, don't say anything? Mm. I mean, one thing I've learned is everybody, can contribute to resistance in different ways. And sometimes if you have a family and you're trying to feed your family and you know the moment you say something, they may rip you away from your livelihood. Um, it's hard to say to that person, you know, don't say this. But there are various other ways in which people can contribute to resistance and organizing work. Mm -hmm. it, I'll say on top of that, um, Finding different ways to challenge institutions from the from the outside as folks also try to move things on the inside. You know, the only the only way we survive this is that we realize that we're in it together. Mm -hmm. So whether you're in this field or in that field or in that field, how are we in relationship to each other where we can apply pressure from the outside so that folks on the inside can begin to to be in their wholeness? I don't know about y'all, but I've been to many jobs where I feel like I gotta swallow a piece of myself over and over and over again just so that I don't disrupt my life. And so we have to figure out, like, how do we hold each other in that? How do we challenge these institutions that are making sure that you can't be in your wholeness? And then what movements are you making within the institutions? And then also, like, what, what can you do from where you are? What are the different ways in which you can contribute? So now, the, these, are, these are two related questions. The first one is, in most cases, police encounters with victims um, result in excessive number of officers who were used to subdue the victims. So how can activism address a change in police procedures to reduce the need for five or more officers being sent out to subdue and restrain an alleged person of interest? So that's one. And then this is a question specifically directed to you, Lamomba, because I think it's related. Can you elaborate on what needs to happen before we re discuss repairing the relationship between police and communities of color? Why, why, is it, why, why are so many officers dispatched for one person when it's a person of color, and can that be changed? Right. You know, I think this is part of what Tenjiwe has talked talked about earlier in terms of our lives, our lives in general being criminalized. That we are seen as something other than actually what we are. And just you know, we, we're not just talking you know in terms of rhetoric. There's actual research that's been done mm -hmm. that talks about how black children are seen to be as older than they actually are. That they seem to be by other people larger than they actually are, and that we seem to have more of a dangerous presence. And so that kind of framing sets the stage you know, for this, this kind of reality. Um, again, when we talk about this idea of, of what needs to happen um, before we talk about repairing relationships, if I'm in an abusive relationship with someone, I want to figure out how I can stop this person from abusing me. I don't want to be able to go to bed at night and hold hands, mm -hmm. if at any instance that person can turn around and take my life. Mm -hmm. What can I do individually to prevent this from happening? How can I change that power dynamic? That essentially is what we're talking about because if we're talking about just being able to throw a basketball or a football and have a barbecue, then nah, we're gonna, yeah. be in this, we're gonna be in this for a long time. Yeah, um, we have about five minutes left and I wanted to ask this question. I didn't, I wanted to sort of hold it till toward the end before we let everyone have final thoughts. And it, it's actually a question that's more appropriate for the family and I don't know if, if anyone in the family, um, maybe Mr. Miller's um, widow or anyone is, is, is feels 
comfortable answering it. Um, and this person is saying that, you know, obviously Arthur Miller was coming to the defense of his brother who was with him. And um, this questioner would like to know what became um, of, his, of his brother. If, the, if anyone in the family wants to answer that. As a right now, his brother is deceased. OK. And, uh, Just pull the mic up a little closer so people can hear you. Yeah. The thing that the, that, I don't know, the brother family, the thing that hit me the most, that hurt me, was that the policeman was always at the building at 9 to 5. Mm -hmm. They were always there, not only on the weekend. Sometimes during this shift, they would stop by. Uh, <coughs> I'm not only just wait to the He's working on the 32 floor. He was rebuilding the 32 floor. So they wanted to know uh, how did he know what part to do this and how did he get this work? They were always the asking them questions. They came for a couple of meetings with the women in the building, you know, giving the safety tips as, uh, when you shop them, don't shop along. How to hold your keys to use them as a weapon. Yeah. All these things, I mean, they were there constantly. All of a sudden, where were those policemen when this incident happened? The only thing that they could say was one policeman who gave me the lady the book, I wasn't on duty. I had nothing to do with it. You know, don't blame me. What do you know that you're not saying? Mm -hmm. It has to be something there. You don't want to be blamed. You know, something happened. Another thing was on the video, I think I spoke about it before. I was working on a building, on Ocean Avenue. Sam, the brother driving a truck. Construction name on the truck. Why would you stop him, even if you had this foresight and know that his license was suspended? Send him to go get his brother to right. come back. Mm -hmm. You know, if he's such a dangerous thing, why didn't you take Sam around there to the building? Or take Sam to jail? Mm -hmm. And then I'll pick up the truck some other time. There were just so many unanswered questions. And in less than half an hour, there were helicopters in the area. What did they think he was going to do? Walk like Jesus did? You know, just come from behind that car where they had him, uh, the chokehold in the back of the car. He was going to just become reincarnated and, and, and they needed to have the helicopters there for moral support. There were just so many things going on at that time that no one could answer for us. And the only thing, we got a nice letter, a very nice letter, that told us how sorry they were. It was an unfortunate accident. You know, the policeman, when Art held his hand up, they saw the gun at his waist, and they panic. Mm. Are they that weak, that stupid? Mm. That they see a, a gun that's holstered at the waist, and 20 men have to jump on you to hold you down? Mm. You know, nothing makes, they answered none of our questions, but they said another letter. I think we ended up with three letters. Crap. You know, Arthur had children he didn't see grow up. Two daughters got married. He didn't walk them down the aisle. He had grandchildren. And we have a gorgeous great-grandson. They would never know him. They would never know his goodness, his kindness, his strength, his weakness. And the only thing he wanted to do, he knew he was born. He knew one day he was going to die. In between, that was very important to him. That's the most important thing you can do between death and birth, what you do in between. And that's the way he lived his life, trying to do something in between birth and death, to live, to leave something on earth, to leave something in Crown Heights, an area which he loved. He was Bahamian. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Crown Heights, New York, was, was, was a dream of his coming. But he wanted to leave something behind, not only for his children, for the whole community. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I think uh, it is appropriate to give this family um, a round of applause. Thank you all so much for being here. It's such an honor. It's such an honor to have had you here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.